Welcome to Read Between the Lines, a book podcast. I am your host, Molly Southgate, and today I'm interviewing... Boyd Morrison. And... Beth Morrison. Hi there. How are you doing today? Doing great. How are you? I'm doing great to be here. Yes, I'm so excited to have you on. I've been reading your book and it is absolutely incredible. Oh my God, I'm... I'm obsessed. I I don't read too many in this genre. And as soon as I picked it up, I was like, uh, just drawn in. So, And it's great. Great. Thank you. So can you tell me a little bit about it, actually? Yeah, I'll I'll take the lead on that one. Uh, (laughs) We always have to decide who's going to be giving the the answers. Uh, So Mm -hmm. our book uh, is a departure for me. Uh, I've written 12 books in uh, contemporary thrillers, and this one's a historical thriller that takes place in 1351, right after the worst of the Black Death and during the Hundred Years' War between England and France. And a knight with a sordid background is riding along a uh, deserted country road in England, and he comes across a noblewoman who is fleeing from some some, uh, bad characters who are trying to do her in. And um, he comes to her rescue and finds out that she is fleeing from her brutal fiancé, but he doesn't know why. Um, And he comes to learn that she is in possession of something that is so valuable that um, people across the continent are trying to to get it for themselves because it could change the balance of power in Christendom. And so they are on the run from these powerful forces that are after it on an epic journey across Europe. Yes. And it's such it's it's so high paced, as you're just describing, like it's um, it's a very exciting book to read. Um, and it 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 does feel it's it's a thriller, which is it's really exciting to read that in like a medieval setting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And How we that... chose the medieval setting because of that. Oh, indeed. Tell a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, as Boyd said, this is a departure for him, but it's also a departure for me because I've only ever written in nonfiction before. I'm actually a scholar by training. And so all of my previous books um, have been scholarly works. And so it was really fun to join forces with Boyd and bring my knowledge of history to his knowledge of how to write a thriller and kind of combine forces that way. And as you said, I think the result is a really, really fast paced but historically accurate as much as we could do uh, way of looking at the Middle Ages. That is so incredible. How did the two of you decide to work together on this? Can I get like the the co-authorship journey? Yes. So I have, um, as I said, written 12 thrillers, six of them with um, Clive Cussler. So I have experience co-writing books up till then. And um, I was, I was leaving the Oregon Files series, which was what I was doing with Clive, and trying to decide what I would do next. And one option I was thinking of was historical thriller, and I I didn't know what time period to do. I know a lot. I'm I'm very into World War II history, but that that genre is pretty full. And so I was thinking of what else to do, and I was talking to my wife about it, and she said, "Well, if you want to do a historical thriller, you've got a built-in co-author." And I said, well, who's that? And she said, uh, your sister, Beth, who is a uh, world authority on the Middle Ages because she is the senior curator of medieval manuscripts at the Getty Museum in Los Angeles. And I said, oh, yeah, her. <laughs> <laughs> and so I called her up. And what was that phone call like, Beth? Yeah. What did you say to me? I said, would you like to write? Yes. A- that is the best co-author story i think i've I've heard that is awesome what was it like working with a sibling oh wait continue what were you saying yeah just in terms of working with a sibling it was you know it, it was really natural for me because boyd has always used me as kind of a sounding board for his other books And, you know, when he came to like plot problems, he would call me and I was always one of his first readers. And so when he called and he said, would you like to write a fiction book set in the Middle Ages? I was immediately on board. And Boyd and I have always been really close. We've always been good friends. Um, 
We talk now twice a day, every day. I don't think we ever had done that before, but we always were really close. And we have a very similar sense of humor, which gets us over any little difficulties uh, we do run into. But we actually work really, really well together. Don't you think, Boyd? Yeah, and we travel well together. We've taken many trips together, including when we went to England, France, and Italy to research the actual locations that we use in the story. So we went to Canterbury um, and visited the cathedral there. Beth actually knows the the uh, director of the director. That's not the right word. Dean. Dean. Dean of Canterbury Cathedral. So we got to eat in the same dining room where Queen Elizabeth ate, and he took us on a personal tour of the cathedral, and we saw where Thomas Beckett was assassinated. Uh, we went to Mont Saint Michel. Um, we also were lucky to visit Notre Dame Cathedral, which fe fe is featured in the book two months before the fire that um, almost destroyed it. And so it's it's very exciting for me um, to go and visit all of these places, even though our book took place takes place 670 years ago. Virtually every place that we feature in the book, you can still go and see today very much how it would have looked like in the time of our book. Wow, that's fantastic. What, what was that like going on? Like a, kind of as a, was it like mostly a research trip? And how did you balance the the research? Like also just to the, I, I imagine it would be pretty like shocking to actually be in those places and like but taking notes at the same time. How, how did that work out for you? I um I had been a lot of those places before, although um, one of the things was Boyd said, well, you know, we get to, we're the writers, we get to take our characters wherever we want. And so one of the places I had never been was Avignon. And so I was super excited to go um, at this period in the 14th century, the papacy had removed to France under the control of the French king. And they built an amazing palace that Boyd and I and his wife went to visit um, I think the hardest thing for me about traveling is that it's almost like a horse with blinders. I'm not allowed to look at anything that happened after 1351. And that's mm -hmm. really difficult for me because I'm like, we should go see this and we should go see this. And it's like, nope, this is a business trip only before 1351. <laughs> oh, that is that. Oh, wow. That's that sounds like such a magical trip to get to go and like really live in your character's shoes. Yeah, it really gave us a lot. It gave us a lot of ideas because we got to see what they would have seen and and how it might figure into the story. For example, uh, we we saw the the tidal flats around Mont Saint Michel, which is an island for part of the day when the tide comes in, and when the tide goes out, you can actually walk across the sand um, mm -hmm. between the mainland and the island, and there is quicksand there, and so. You might think that quicksand might figure into the story. The I was, yeah, I, so I, I was just reading the, without spoiling anything, I was just reading the section where you where you were talking about how it's an island for part of the day. And as I, as I was reading it, I was like, this is the coolest world building ever. And then immediately I was like, wait, no, it's real. Oh my God, it's even cooler. Um, yeah. Oh, if, if you ever get to go to Mont Saint-Michel, it, it does look like something out of a fantasy novel. You would... You, until you see it, it's it's hard to believe that it really exists like you see it in photos, but it actually is more impressive in person. And to somebody in the time period of our book, it must have looked absolutely fantastical. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. I would I would imagine. Um, so how did your writing styles change when you were writing together versus on your own? So um as Beth said, she has always edited all my books, and I often will call her when I'm stuck with a plot problem, even on a book that she's not writing with me. So we we had a very similar style on this. So the way we work together is we would plot out the book um, together over the phone. A lot of times when each of us is walking our dogs, we would just mm -hmm. be on the phone talking for an hour while we're walking. And um and chew over plot points and figure out difficulties where that, that are blocking us. And then um, we get the basic outline of the story from beginning to end, which was how we decide where we wanna go visit on our, our research trip. 
And then, um, then I will start writing chapters and sending to her them to her as as I'm done with each one. And she reads it and gives me feedback that will affect where we go from there. And we just keep going like that. And then once the whole book is done, Beth will do a really thorough edit and send that back to me. And then then we'll just keep going like that until we're ready to send it into our publisher. That is yeah, my job is cool. really at helping with the plot and then adding in all the medieval details. Like Boyd will say, they walk into a church and then I add in what they see and what the sculptures are like and all that kind of thing. So it really is a kind like of description. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's, does, that's so I cool. do the dialogue and the action and Beth does all the descriptions and <laughs> make sure that I'm not doing something anachronistic, you know, and, and she's my ringer for all the details that I have no idea. Cause I would never have tried this genre without Beth as my ringer, because, you know, I, I will say Isabel was wearing clothes. And then Beth <laughs> and Beth knows that that means, OK, this is where I put on all the she's wearing a surcoat over a kirtle and it's, you know, embroidered with this. And I don't know. But <laughs> luckily, I have Beth for that. Oh, wow. That, that sounds like you guys have such a great system to work on all this. And it as I was reading it, it felt like it was a very smooth read. You know, it didn't feel choppy in any parts. And that makes sense now learning your process for the two of you were really working together. Could you yeah. see yourselves working on a book again? We are actually working on book two right now. We went to, oh, that's uh, so cool. Yeah, the way we've envisioned this uh, as a series is that it's basically a tour of medieval Europe. And so in the second book, we last fall, we went to Italy and Greece to research locations because Gerard Fox is a knight errant. He is traveling around Europe during this time of war and post-pandemic uh, recovery. And uh, so we uh, we just took it as an opportunity to say, where do we want to go next to do our research? That is that sounds like the greatest writing thing ever. It's like it's like the dream to get to go and travel and go see like everywhere that your character was and stuff like that. Um, I think a lot so, of people ask about working together as siblings and traveling and all of that. And we actually just have a great time. I mean, we really have fun doing this, um, you know, from every plot point to traveling together to like going on book tour together. We just have a really good time. And we put in little Easter eggs for each other in the story based on stuff that happened during our trip. Nobody else will get it. It's just for me and Beth. But you Would know, you share I, one of those? <laughs> well, it's it's in the uh, it's in the upcoming book. Um, I think I can say it. So so every we we love gelato in Italy, and so we came every time we saw a gelato stand, we would say alerto because we didn't know the Italian word for uh, alert. There's a gelato stand that we need to go get some gelato from and so every time whether we ate there or not we said alerto every time we saw one so we came there came a point in the story where gerard fox had to warn some italians of something and what what did what happened beth and and he can't think of the word for alert in Italian, so he starts screaming "alerto, alerto!" And Boyd sent me the chapter, and I actually was um, I was sitting in the living room with my boyfriend, and I started laughing hysterically when I read that. And like Boyd said, I think people will find it mildly amusing, but they won't double over with laughter like I did. Oh, I, I love those kind of Easter eggs, and that's. So perfect. Oh, I'm sorry. What were you saying about, about the afterward? Well, well, uh, Beth wrote an afterward for book one, and and I assume she will do the same for book two, so she could she could put some, something like that in the afterward. Yeah. Oh, that that kind of context is something that can make books so much like 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 even richer, like knowing like the the little stories behind it and Easter eggs and things like that. I, like the one I had someone who was I think it was the Twilight Zone. They were really obsessed with. And then in the book, there was a line from one of the episodes and it's like something that no one would notice, but to them, it was the greatest part of the entire book. And it's, 
it, those moments like that are so much fun to, to to have the background on as a reader. Yeah, I think there. I think we put in like an homage to some movie or or two in the first book, but I can't remember the particular instances right now. Can you? Yeah, I remember one. When, and Boyd is really clever at putting these Easter eggs in. It's mostly dialogue that then recalls dialogue from famous movies. So um, you'll notice, Molly, at some point when you read the book, they're in a, a difficult situation and things keep going wrong. And one of the characters says um, either to themselves or someone else, the odds are not in our favor, <laughs> which recalls the Hunger Games. <laughs> so Yeah. That is, that's incredible. You know what, now that you mention it, I think I might have read that part and yeah. just <laughs> completely like not, not put that together. But now that you say it, I absolutely. Yeah. We don't want to make it so obvious that it takes you out of the story, but on the other hand, we're writing, this is escapist fiction. We want people mm-hmm. to be entertained. We want to, we were trying to harken back to the stories of the three musketeers and Robin hood and treasure Island, just high adventure that keeps you going through the book as fast as possible and um, just to enjoy the story. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's that's what happened. So it's, it's a really fun book, as I was saying. Um, so who were some, speaking of like books and movies and stuff that you're referencing and things like that, who were some of your biggest influences? I think um, one of the things that's really fun for me is that this type of literature, literally the romance thriller, was a type that was invented in the Middle Ages. It's one of the greatest legacies of the Middle Ages. And so Boyd was saying that the book harkens back to high adventures. Well, that genre was invented in the Middle Ages. And one of my specialties is secular French romance, as we call it. Um, And we call it romance because it comes from roman in French, which just means, uh, you know, a a secular adventure or actually nowadays means a novel. And so um, the genre became so um, popular that they actually, as I said, use the word roman for a novel in French. And so we're really drawing on that when we're trying to come up with the plot. Um, So my influences were actually medieval manuscripts that I've worked on. There's one that I've written a book about called the Roman de Julien de Trazegny, um, which is the story of a knight who adventures and goes on um, adventures and has, you know, has pirate paddles at sea and rescues a princess. and, And all of that really comes forward in our book, I think. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, I, I love, uh, yeah, it's like those, those certain archetypes and things like that that date back. That's that's awesome that it like was invented in the time period you're writing about because that doesn't happen a lot when you're looking at things that use those kind of, I, tropes has a bad connotation now, but I I mean the, what it actually means where it's yeah. it's like the, yeah. what, what the, <laughs> like the basic story structure. Right. Yeah, and and uh, Lee Child, who who was um, kind enough to give us a blurb for the book, he said that uh, Gerard Fox could be uh, Jack Reacher's ancestor seven hundred years ago, which I thought was mm-hmm. great. And he has often said that Jack Reacher is based on the on the trope or the or the style of the knight errant, um, where he's traveling around and he goes into a town and helps out the people, and then he leaves. And um, you can see that kind of tradition in all kinds of stories, like the man with no name, Clint Eastwood Westerns. He was the knight errant of the West. Uh, The Mandalorian is basically a science fiction knight errant. And so Beth and I just really wanted to go back to the origins of that and actually write about a knight errant in the Middle Ages because we really hadn't seen a a action packed story about that. Um, and so we just decided, hey, let's go back to the source and and do that in, in the original time period. And so that's what Gerard Fox is. He's he's a knight with no land and no title. And and uh, he is he is uh, traveling around trying to bring justice to a world that's, you know, in in trying to recover from the worst pandemic in history, trying to get through a, a war in Europe. And uh, nothing relevant about any of that to today's world. <laughs> oh no, not at all. Oh, that is so cool. So kind of a kind of a pivot, but 
This is a general question for both of you, but also I'm going to ask a more specific question for Beth. But how did you start writing? Like, in general, like, what what interested you in it? And also for you, Beth, what interested you in, like, the the medieval (laughs) setting and, like, learning that kind of history? Um, So I was really lucky. Um, I really found my calling early. Um, Boyd and I went to a very good high school in Kansas City, Missouri. And the wife of the principal was bored after her kids left and she had been an art history major. So she decided to teach an art history class. And we started with cave paintings and we got to the Middle Ages and I was sold. I was 15 years old and I just knew that that's what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And I've been very fortunate uh, to be able to make that dream come true. Um, medieval manuscripts is a really, really tiny, tiny, tiny field. Um, and there aren't that many jobs. So I really, um, sincerely believe it when I say that I have the best job in the world. And in terms of turning my hand to fiction rather than nonfiction, it's been really freeing because, you know, when we can't figure something out or my research doesn't turn up anything, we just make it up and you don't get to do that in scholarly writing. (laughs) Uh, and for me, um, I've always been a big thriller reader. Um, in fact, I, I had often said before I started working with Clive Cussler that uh, in in when I would interview, they would ask me what was the most influential book in for me, and that and I often said it was *Race the Titanic* by Clive Cussler. Um, that was the book that got me interested in reading thrillers. And and I was a big fan of his for 30 years. And then when I got the call to actually work with him, it was just an amazing transition from being a fan of his to actually sitting in his office and brainstorming ideas for the first book that we worked on together. And, um, you know, I think one of the reasons he asked me to write with him was because he (laughs) <laughs> recognized his influence in my own writing because he was known for his fast pace, incredible action, um, chapter ending cliffhangers that don't let you stop reading just, you know, on one chapter. And so that I kind of internalized all of that storytelling style into my own. And so when I started writing with Clive, I really didn't have to change anything about my writing style. I was already doing that. And um, and so that's the kind of style we wanted to bring to this, because sometimes up till now, historical thrillers were usually divided into either mysteries where it's a monk or somebody solving a murder at one location, or it's It's a different way of looking at an actual historical event. So it's about the ladies maid of Queen Elizabeth I, or it's about a foot soldier at the Battle of Hastings or something like that. Whereas we just wanted to come up with a, like I said, going back to just adventure tales that Beth was referring to of the Middle Ages of just adventuring around and, and having all kinds of incredible things happen, but in this medieval setting. And so that's what we wanted to do in this story. That is that all of that is so fantastic. Could you tell me a little bit about your, your work with him and like how that was different, that co-authorship experience was different than working on this one. So when, when I, when I got the call from my agent that Clive wanted to work with me, I was of course flabbergasted and and I said, sure, I'd love to work with him. And she said, OK, he's going to call you in two minutes. <laughs> and so it was totally out of the blue. And he called up and said, hey, Boyd, I read a couple of your books and I love them and wondered if you wanted to write the organ files with me. And I said, that would be fantastic. And he said, OK, we're going to fly you down here in two weeks and get started. And sure enough, two weeks later, I was sitting in his office brainstorming the ideas for our first book, Piranha. And. The way we worked was that I I would go down for a couple of days to his house in Phoenix and we would come up with the basic plot structure for the book. What's the villain after that? He always had an historical element to the story. What are the main locations uh, in the world that we are going to feature and maybe some action set pieces that we are going to feature in the story. And once we came up with all of that, 
I would come back uh, home to Seattle and I would write a hundred pages and I would send them to him and he would read them over and give his feedback and send them back to me. And we just keep going like that till the book was done. Um, he gave me a lot of freedom to come up with a story. And so it's different in the respect that, as Beth said, we Beth and I talk every day about plotting and which is great because if if I I it's hard for me to have writer's block because if I have, if I don't know what to do, I just call up Beth and say, I can't figure out what to do in this chapter. What do you think? And then we'll talk through it. And then usually by the end of the phone call, we're like, oh yeah, that'll be cool. Let's do that. And so yeah, it's it makes it a lot uh, uh, very fun to work with Beth on that. Oh, that's so cool. And I also I also really find that writer's block thing interesting because that that does sound like kind of the best way to beat it. Um, have somebody that you can kind of call up and and outline. I've that's I was listening to something last night actually all about like writer's block and how the, the person that was on the podcast didn't think it was real um, because you can always <laughs> turn to like an outline or something and then you have something to do. Um, I I I have. <laughs> I disagree with that. I think <laughs> that's writer's block because um, I know so many writers that that is true. And, you know, you, we all have different ways of dealing with it. Uh, for me, it's procrastination and and me terror too. when my deadline is coming. Um, but it, I think it works a lot better working with Beth and having somebody I can bounce ideas off of. Because I think that's when most people get writer's block. They don't know what to do, or they have a thorny plot problem they can't get over, and so they just avoid it. Um, but with Beth, I, I don't have to avoid it. I can just call her up and say, hey, uh, you know, I need I need Gerard Fox to escape this prison cell. What is a, What would be in a prison cell at this time period? Do they have prison cells? Would it be a dungeon? You know, what, how, what, how are the locks, you know, basic stuff that I don't know. And I can just call Beth and she'll, she'll tell me all of that. And then that sparks ideas and Beth comes up with a lot of ideas and, and we'll just bounce them back and forth. And we actually do brainstorming where we'll just say, well, and, and it gets silly, like, right, Beth? (laughs) What, What are some of the things that we, techniques that we use? We, uh, we often use laughter and jokes as a way of getting over plot problems. We'll be in a really intense thing. Like, how is he going to escape from this jail cell when the pe- the other, the bad guys, men know exactly where he is? And we, we just sit there in silence for a second. And then one of us will say, well, he'll just use his cell phone and call for help, you know? <laughs> and, and so that, you know, or, you know, well, why don't we just have a helicopter come get him? That'd be easy enough. And so it's things like that. And then that kind of breaks the tension. And then usually we can get into a new flow. So that helps a lot. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, you know, I, so I, I have a friend that I write with a lot and I have a hundred percent also found that to be true. <laughs> just say something completely out of, out of, like character for the character to do or like something wildly like that could never happen in the world and it usually will completely break it up and then you can actually come up with something from there exactly you know this was so great to have you guys on thank you so much oh thank you it's been great I just have, oh i'm sorry what were you saying i just said this has been so fun <laughs> i just have one last question and that is what do you have coming up we are working on book two right now. Um, we can't say the title yet, but uh, hopefully it will be out next fall. We're almost done with it. And uh, I think it's it's a fun follow-up to the first story. And we get to visit lots of, lots more cool medieval locations that we actually got to see in person. And hopefully readers will see them, especially readers who have been able to see them in real life will now be able to look at them in a different way. And one of the things that I think is really fun about our books, because I'm involved, is when we are writing the first book, I I told Boyd, well, we can do anything, but an artwork has to be central to the plot. And we're doing that again in the second book, which I think will be really fun and and really lets me use some of my art historical powers. (laughs) Yes, of course, a medieval manuscript was central to the story in book one. Beth Mm -hmm. would not let me write (laughs) the first story without that being key to the plot 
of course you gotta you gotta play on everybody's strengths oh that is that is so exciting good luck with publishing with all of that and finishing up the book i will definitely be on the lookout for it for read between the lines my name is molly southgate i'm boyd morrison and i'm beth morrison let's end this the way all great stories end happily ever after the end Thank you for listening to Read Between the Lines, a book podcast. You can follow the show on Instagram and Facebook at Read Between the Lines Podcast and on Twitter at RBTL Podcast. Make sure to follow the authors who I've been talking to to hear all about their upcoming projects and also because they're cool people. This show is hosted by me, Molly Southgate, and produced and edited by my dad, Rob Southgate. Read Between the Lines is a Southgate Media Group production, and you can find all the great content put on by the network at southgatemediagroup.com. You can read the story of how I and many other podcasters started in the anthology book Pod Life, which you'll find at the link in the show notes. Also in the show notes are links to buy the books featured on this episode. Using those links supports this show and the incredible authors being interviewed. Have a great week and keep reading.